Uh, last week we talked about uh, steps, Jesus' steps to improving bad relationships and even when to end them if necessary. And we said, if we do have to end certain relationships, you can't have any bitterness when you do so. So today we're going to just talk about uh, bitterness and forgiveness. I just want to share with you a quick story um, that just it has come to my mind because uh, I wanted to share with you my own example of bitterness, just because you need to have some emotional weight if you're really going to uh, experience Jesus' power to forgive. So years ago, I was talking to a friend on the phone, and I was sharing um, with her my frustration with young people, not here. <laughs> and she said, you sound so bitter. And I said, oh, I guess actually I am. And so I went to the grade 7 teacher at another parish where I was at, and I said to the grade 7 teacher, I don't want to go visit your class. She is surprised, right? And I said, you know what? Why should I bother? They're honestly, they're, they're rude, and they're arrogant, and just because I'm a priest doesn't mean I have to put up with that. So honestly, if you ask me, I don't want to visit. I guess I have to, but I don't want to. Okay. So that's, that was wearing me down. And it was wearing me down because, of course, I care about these kids. So whenever we're, we're bitter, it comes out in, in many different subtle ways. We don't use the person's name that we're mad at. We avoid making eye contact with them. We get passive aggressive. And we even think about how we can hurt them in return. We think about it in our, you know, the way they hurt us, I want to hurt them back. So we're going to meditate on Jesus' gospel here, and we're going to look at three parts of it. So the first part, St. Peter asks Jesus, how many times do we have to forgive? And Jesus replies, not seven times, but I t tell you, 77 times. Now, that means without limit, okay? So for those of you in the Journey Through Scripture course, you're going to learn this week. In Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, if you make a covenant with someone, if you make an oath, you literally say, I seven myself. Okay, so that's why seven is the word of the, mean, the number of perfection. So to say 77 times means without limit. Now, of course, we know this doesn't mean you have to be a, door, uh, a doormat. Uh, forgiveness just says, okay, we might have to end our relationship, but I still want what's best for you. And there is no bitterness in my heart. Uh, second part. At the end of the parable and gospel, Jesus says, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt you, because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay the entire debt. Here's the good part. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Wow. Okay, so let's be clear. Jesus is saying we're going to go to hell if we don't forgive people. Now, why is that? Because you can't have bitterness in heaven, logically, right? So can you imagine if we get to heaven and then you see someone over there that you don't like and you're like, well, what's he doing there? <laughs> you just ruined heaven. You can't have bitterness there. Okay, third part of the parable, the actual parable of what's called the parable of the wicked servant, it's teaching us why we have to forgive. So the wicked servant owes his matter some incredible debt. Let's say it's worth $3 billion. That's what we're trying to, in today's figure, so $3 billion. He asks the master for patience. He promises to pay back. He kneels down. And of course, he can't pay it back. But the master still forgives him $3 billion. And then another servant comes along who owes him three months wages. And that servant makes him pay. Even though that other servant did the exact same thing, he goes down on his knee, knees, asks for patience. So really what we're talking about is justice here. That wicked servant receives mercy, but won't extend it to others. So it's a matter of justice. So we should really forgive everyone who swears at us, considering that God has offered us forgiveness for all the times in the past when, let's say, we've sworn at people. So considering all the times we've lied during our lives, we have to forgive people who lie against us now. 
Now, sometimes, of course, we'll say, but hang on, the sins I've committed in the past aren't as bad as what other people do to me. Now, are you sure about that? So think very hard, because we often forget. Think about the sins that you honestly, like you wouldn't tell your spouse, you don't want your parents to know about, like you go to confession and you're feeling really nervous, I don't want to say that, or you go, these are the kind of sins that make us go to another church to find a priest that doesn't know us. Okay? So think really hard. So I remember this time when I was a teenager and I ignored Father Doyle. So I was, um, this is the priest that inspired me to think about being a priest. And so I was playing road hockey and Father Doyle walks by and I ignored him. I don't think about this incident almost ever. But when I do think about it, I still feel very guilty. Why did I do that? Like, there's no reason. The good, great thing about remembering how rude and mean I was to Father Doyle is it put in perspective when I thought about those grade sevens. I started thinking about, man, I, I, I've done a lot of bad things. Okay, so that helped me to love those grade sevens and to figure out where the Holy Spirit, how he wanted me to respond. And then you have to really consider, what if the people who have hurt us, what if they haven't received as many graces as we did? Let, let's say you had really good parents. What if the people who have hurt you, they didn't have as good parents as you? What if you had way more opportunities given by God? Because that happens. So you have to think about grace. So this reality of grace is really uh, the most important. God's forgiveness is freely given to us. You can't earn it. No one, absolutely no one deserves to go to heaven because of the sins they've committed. And we're going to talk about that next week. But God freely offers us forgiveness through Jesus' cross, and that is applied to us in baptism and confirmation. Most of the famous paintings of Jesus on the cross, they have him looking down, likely because he was dead at that point. But when Jesus prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, it's likely that he was looking up. Because we know from four other points in the gospel that when Jesus prayed, it says he raised his eyes to heaven. And that teaches us something so important. In order to forgive, you don't want to look at other people and their sins against us. You need to look up. You need to look at God the Father's mercy towards us. We really have to think, do we understand what it means to offend God? Do you understand how bad it is to hurt God in even the smallest way? So I'll give you an example. It's always worse to hurt an innocent person than a guilty person. So let's say you've got a gang member and he willingly joins the gang. He does all these horrible things and then he gets shot and killed. That's tragedy. But let's say an innocent person gets caught in a crossfire between two gangs. That would be worse. So in the same way, it's worse, let's say if we swear to our mom, you know, we say something really nasty towards our mom, that's worse than swearing let's, against our brothers because typically our moms love us more. Therefore, the worst sin is against God because he is the most innocent, he's the most good. Even a small sin against God, it's terrible because you've hurt someone perfect. This is a 19th century uh, fresco in a, in a church in Spain. And an 81-year-old woman, she wasn't in her right mind. She decided it needed to be restored, and so she did this. Okay, so this made the news around the world as an absolute disaster. So let's say someone ruins my painting. It's not a big deal <laughs> because it's not that good. But this woman destroyed a masterpiece. So if you think, when even you hurt God in the tiniest way, even the littlest sin, it's like a nick on a masterpiece. You've just ruined something so beautiful. So considering all the times we've hurt God with our little nicks, we offend his, him, he's the masterpiece, this is why we should forgive other people. Now it doesn't mean uh, we have to feel good towards them because forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It doesn't also mean that we have to ignore our need for healing. 
Actually, for most of us, the way to actually receive healing is to forgive. It starts with forgiveness and healing will come after that. About three months ago, I told you a story about a woman named Millie. I don't know if you remember. She left her husband and her three children for another man. And her husband, he received healing because he forgave her first. So he actually said, I quoted to you, with all that Christ did to forgive me, how could I look at my wife and say, you've done something so horrible that I can't forgive you? So for most of us, the, the healing will come after the forgiveness. Now, for some of us, the only way we're going to be able to forgive is by feeling healing first. So three weeks ago, we talked about that woman named Faith Hagsley. The only way she could forgive her rapist was when she encountered God's love and his hope through Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. So whatever our case is, main thing is, don't look at other people's sins against you. Look up and look at God's forgiveness of you.